Hello, my name is Tom Hoffman. Alex, I'm very pleased to be here today to present my paper on heritage conservation and sustainable development at this conference. This presentation looks at the relationship between these two concepts, and more specifically, using case studies of the adaptive reuse of the Blue Health Cluster in Hong Kong. The adaptive reuse project involved the revitalization of a group of three Chinese tenement houses, known as Tao Lao, which were built between the 1920s and 50s. Notably, the project was honored with the UNESCO Award of Excellency in Cultural Heritage Conservation in 2017. It serves as an exceptional model that integrates value based, fabric based, and people centered approach in the field of heritage conservation. It goes beyond merely preserving the physical architectural structure. It also prioritizes the preservation of the community residing within them. This initiative demonstrates how social sustainability can be achieved by safeguarding tangible architectural elements and intangible neighborhood network and ambience. The success of this project is a benchmark for similar endeavors aimed at protecting historic buildings and neighborhoods from the threats of gentrification. However, despite its accomplishment, it remains the only instance of such a heritage revitalization model in Hong Kong. This can be attributed primarily to the influence of neoliberal urban policies, the lack of comprehensive framework or policy for community involvement, and the government's failure to integrate heritage conservation into the sustainability agenda. This presentation composes of two parts. The first part will provide an overview of the Blue Health Cluster project, including its context, concept, and notable achievement. The second part will identify inconsistency and gap in the local heritage policy. Additionally, I will utilize the UNESCO thematic indicator for culture in the 2030 agenda, known as the Culture 2030 Indicators, as an evaluative framework to assess the project's contributions to local sustainability development. Now let's move on to the first part, the adaptive reuse of the Blue House Cluster project in Hong Kong. These buildings, namely the Blue House, Yellow House and Orange House, were constructed at different times, with the Blue House and Yellow House dating back to the 1920s, while the Orange House was built during the 50s and 60s. Originally, these buildings were constructed to meet the increasing housing demand due to the population growth in that era. However, over time, only a few of these traditional Chinese-style houses have managed to survive in the districts till today. It is important to note that the site on which these buildings stand holds significant historical value in the context of Hong Kong's urban development. It served as one of the settlements while Chinese refugees initially established themselves during the early colonial era and also function as the first uh, hospital for Chinese people in the 1850s. So more about the urban context. One tries the district where the Blue House Cluster is located. It has experienced significant gentrification, with old buildings being demolished to make way for urban redevelopment. It has transformed into a densely populated district known for its high living courses. The residents who live in the old tenement houses were particularly vulnerable, including low-income families and elderly individuals who couldn't afford the soaring rent within the same area. The adaptive use project emerged amidst a controversial urban redevelopment proposal by the Urban Renewal Authority, URA, in 2006. This proposal aimed to displace the current residents and convert the building into tourist attractions. The ULA is a statutory body responsible for transforming old districts into new residential and commercial areas. The original plan intended to turn the Blue House into a Chinese medicine museum, the Yellow House into a Chinese tea museum, and demolish the Orange House to create an open space. However, the proposal faced strong opposition from residents and civil society due to concerns about disrupting the community network in the area. Residents reject the ULA's plan and actively protest, expressing their desire to remain in the buildings. Seeking assistance, they turned to St. James Settlement, 
a neighboring social organization that became the leading agency in the Adaptive Reuse Project. Collaborating with various civil organizations and heritage experts, they successfully negotiate an alternative plan. As a result, the government halted the ULA's proposal and initiated a new Adaptive Reuse Plan under the Revitalizing Heritage Building Through Partnership Scheme in 2009. In the following year, St. James Settlement, along with heritage experts, submitted a conservation plan prioritizing the retention of the building and tenants. The plan was accepted and subsequently approved by the government. Here is the historic timeline of the building and adaptive reuse project. Emerging from the conventional tourism oriented model, the new plans aim to preserve the existing function of the buildings. It includes 18 residential units, free shop space for social enterprises, two restaurants, one exhibition space, and several classrooms and recreation area for arts and cultural activities. A bridge was constructed to link the three building blocks. Following the revitalization, the site gained a social and public dimension, offering a diverse range of cultural offering to the general public. The Blue House now features a small museum showcasing the past way of life, and guided tours and cultural activities are regularly organized to promote cultural memories and various intangible aspects of local cultural heritage. Additionally, the open space has been enhanced to serve as a gathering place for the communities. This decade-long adaptive reuse project has faced some criticism, particularly regarding the lengthy process from conception to realization. During this time, approximately half of the existing residents choose to relocate. However, I argue that such criticism overlooked the complexity of the project, which had to adjust multiple challenges. For example, it needed to preserve the unique architectural feature of the buildings while navigating the historical and social context and restoring the site as a community hub. Moreover, the project involved numerous stakeholders with diverse expectations and occasionally conflicting views. I believe that the project has successfully exemplified an integrated approach to heritage conservation, incorporating historical value base fabric-based and people-centered approach in the adaptive reuse of the buildings. In these sections, I will explore the integrated approach of the adaptive reuse project by examining different heritage values. Just let's discuss the historical value of this site. The location holds great significance in Hong Kong as it is associated with the history of Chinese settlements since the 19th century. During the early colonial period, Chinese migrants were only allowed to settle in peripheral areas of the central district on Hong Kong Island. The site became one of the places where these migrants established their homes. Over time, it experienced two major waves of Chinese migration from mainland China, coinciding with significant political and social events. As a result, the buildings on the site were adopted for residential use to accommodate the rising demand for housing driven by mass migration. Therefore, the site's former uses are closely linked to the urban development history of Hong Kong. One of the key elements of the adaptive reuse project is the establishment of the House of Stories, which is a museum of living history located on the ground floor of the Blue House. The museum showcases typical furniture and furnishing from the Chinese tenement houses, offering insights into traditional lifestyle of the past generations in Hong Kong. It also organizes guided tours that provide visitors with deeper understanding of the daily life of the past and the evolution of the urban fabrics. Now let's move on to the fabric-based value of the site, particularly its architectural significance. The building on the site, known as Tong Lao, represents a typical vernacular tenement house style that was popular among the Chinese community in the 19th, 20s and 30s. However, only a few of these buildings remain in Hong Kong today. These structures are characterized by their proximity 
farming cluster with commercial shop space on the ground floor and residential apartment on the upper floor. The features long rectangular interior with verandas at the facade, while windows are typically located on the facades and back of the building. Um, this unique architectural style represents an early version of Chinese urban tenement houses influenced by European design. The verandas designed and hangs air ventilation and lighting uh, serve as climate adaptive features suitable for warm and humid climate of Southeast Asia. These buildings are rare examples of Chinese tenement houses that were constructed in compliance with the early building ordinance during the colonial period in Hong Kong. Regarding the adaptive use element, the project adopted a minimal intervention approach for building conservation. The aim was to minimize alteration to the structure and when modification were necessary to meet modern standards, they were executed in a reversible manner. The project was preserved all the buildings on the site without significant structural changes, maintaining their existing uses. The buildings were in a deteriorated state before the adaptive reuse and significant improvements were made during the restoration process. Moving on to the People's Centered Value, the site served as a space that fostered a sense of community and mutual support among its residents. From the 1860s to the 1930s, the site fulfilled various functions such as a Chinese medical hospital, a temple and a free school for Chinese people in Hong Kong. It was closely connected to the local philanthropic development aimed at enhancing the well-being of the community. In terms of adaptive use elements, all existing tenants were given the option to stay after the completion of the project instead of being relocated. The strong sense of neighborhood provides a foundation for community participation in the heritage planning, management, and interpretation process. The project adopts a participatory, democratic decision-making approach actively involving tenants in the heritage management plan. While some tenants choose to move on, the vacant uh, residential units were occupied by new tenants through the Good Neighbor Scheme. The following section discusses the inconsistency and gaps in the local heritage policy in Hong Kong. Previous research has indicated that Heritage conservation efforts in the city lack a clear vision and are often driven by political and economic factors. The adaptive reuse of a historic building tend to serve as a business initiative catering middle-class consumption rather than prioritizing the preservation of deteriorating old buildings, especially uh, residential ones that directly affect the local population's living condition and quality of life. A public consultation report by Antiquity Advisory Board in Hong Kong emphasized the importance of heritage conservation as part of sustainable development. The report acknowledged that heritage conservation should benefit culture, community, and the economy, with community endorsement playing a crucial role. It highlighted the significance of building interacting with community functioning as living part of it and providing quality public space for enjoyment and inspiration rather than being merely historical artifacts on display. Despite the recognition of sustainable development in the consultation document, official policymakers didn't fully embrace this concept. In a 2005 government report on sustainable development in Hong Kong, Heritage conservation was barely mentioned except for a ray reference on the last page. The report focused primarily on environmental issues overlooking the importance of heritage conservation. A review of another significant government policy on sustainable development revealed that local policy remained limited to a narrow interpretation of sustainable development as a city's capacity to tolerate environmental degradation, rather than recognizing it as a shared civil responsibility. This perspective was evidenced in the top-down policy-making process that disregarded the role of civil participation. 
the term sustainability appears in various Hong Kong government policy papers, but it lacks a precise definition and exhibits gaps and inconsistency in its interpretation. Moreover, there was a lack of clear indicators to measure the effectiveness of policies. To address these issues, the study applies UNESCO assessment framework, Culture 2030 indicator, to evaluate the contribution of the Blue House Cluster project to the sustainable development of the community. The concept of sustainable development in this study is based on the definition provided in the Brunet report. The Blue House Cluster project which won the UNESCO Asia Pacific Award for Cultural Heritage Conservation in 2017, is celebrated for its inclusive approach for preserving not just the architecture, but also the way of life and sense of belonging of a marginalized community. The Blue House Cluster project goes beyond the preservation of physical structure and raises important discussions about intangible heritage in this section, I will utilize the Culture 2030 Indicator as an assessment framework to demonstrate how the project contributes to sustainable development in four key aspects. Firstly, in terms of environment and resilience, the project is recognized as a bottom-up community-oriented conservation effort. Tenant and a diverse group of professionals, including social workers, artists, architects, and preservationists, actively participated in the project at the community level. Secondly, the project promotes prosperity and livelihoods by encouraging tenants to support one another and organize community-based activities such as guide tour, concerts, screenings, and social gatherings. These activities are open to the neighborhood and aims to foster a sense of community. Thirdly, the Blue House Cluster project focuses on knowledge and skills. The Associate Museum offers educational programs for children and students, covering oral history, local traditions, customs, and handicraft knowledge. It serves as a social space where individuals from diverse backgrounds and generations can share their life stories, memories, and experience. Yes. The project emphasizes inclusion and participation. It represents the collective effort of the community to safeguard a marginalized heritage in the face of Hong Kong's escalating property market. Without such an initiative, this heritage would not have been valued and included. By examining these four aspects through the Culture 2030 Indicator, we can better understand the significant contribution of the Blue House Cluster project to sustainable development. In conclusion, this study highlights the positive impact of heritage conservation on the development of sustainable communities, as demonstrated by the Blue House Cluster project in Hong Kong. This project serves as a prime example of an integrated approach to heritage conservation and has received international recognition from UNESCO. It goes beyond the mere protect protection of architectural heritage, but also safeguarding people's livelihoods, promoting cultural engagement, preserving traditional values and knowledge, and fostering social inclusion. Given the lack of a clear definition of the role of heritage conservation in the policies of sustainable development, this paper aims to explore an evidence-based methodology for assessing the impact of heritage conservation on sustainable development. I hope the finding of this study will serve as a valuable foundation for future policy recommendation and formulation, ensuring that heritage conservation is effectively integrated into sustainable development agendas. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to share more insights and findings regarding these case studies, and I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback as well. Thank you.